It's time to get all your Star Wars news in a single file. From Fanta Drax TV, this is Good Morning Tatooine! Good morning, Tatooine indeed. This is the final show before celebration, which is fastly, very fastly approaching. And uh, so we've got a whole lot of news to cover today, and uh, obviously celebrations at the heart of that, so let's find out what we're talking about in tonight's show. We've got all the updates from Star Wars Celebration. You will find out where to find Fanta Tracks at it. Um, one Galaxy, One Goal has been launched um, supporting Make-A-Wish and we'll be discussing that. We'll have all the latest guest announcements for Boonta Eve 4 which kicks off Celebration on the Thursday. Um, Sunday night is going to be exciting when Cantina 2 hits the O2. We'll have the latest guest announcements from there. Product-wise, we'll be looking at the Mando Mania releases for a week Number four, um, Genu and Novu um, come into Star Wars Celebration as well, of course. I've released a Rogue One Cassian Andor jacket. We'll be checking that out. We've had the official story trailer for Star Wars Jedi Survivor and that got social media talking, so we'll be checking that trailer out. Um, and then all sorts of news started breaking during the week. Um, quite often it happens just before Celebration as we start getting like a... throw out the negative news and uh, get ready for some excitement. And... Uh, Skeleton Crew, we had a director announcement, um, the Daniels have directed an episode for that. Um, the untitled Star Wars movie project that Damon Lindelof was involved with, he's departed and Stephen Knight um, has joined. We'll be looking at the potential for that movie. Um, Andor has been picking up with BAFTA TV nominations, we'll be checking them out. Big news of the week, um, of course, Ahmed Best returning to the Star Wars live action. We'll be discussing that, and we'll end the show with um, a review of Season 3, Episode 4 of The Mandalorian, which uh, hit Disney Plus this past week, and to discuss that and so much more, Editor-in-Chief of FatherTracks.com, Mr. Mark Newbold. Hello, Brian. How are you? I'm very good, Mark. How are you? Are you all set for celebration? Not remotely. Yes, no. that's how it should be. <laughs> Last minute, you know, we chuck it all in a bag. It'll be fine. Yeah. <clears throat> ten days, roughly. Is it ten days? Yeah, something like that. Yeah, yeah. it all comes together in the end. <laughs> yeah, usually on the last day. Yeah, you don't need a plan. No, nah. <laughs> you don't nah. need a plan. Have we ever had a plan? What are plans? Plans yeah. are to be broken. <laughs> That's very true. Um, we should probably start with what, 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 what are we doing at the show? That's a that's a that's a um, good place as any um, to I start. Think so. And uh, we're all over the show, kicking off on uh, Thursday. We're going to be at Boonie Eve Four at the Breakfast Club over on Canary Wharf, um, where of course they've been filming scenes for Andor and pre before that Rogue One. I'm very much looking forward to this. I, when this when this happened last time, I missed it because I fell asleep. But uh, <laughs> but I have no excuse this time. Uh, I'm I'm very much looking forward to it. Been talking to the guys tonight actually just before we started recording, and uh, yeah, there's uh, Fanta's going to be there podcasting. Fanta is a team. Fanta Radio is a team. It's it's like Radio One turning up. Um, so that should be fun. 
No idea what we're going to talk about, but do we ever? We'll just talk about whatever's happening late. It's latest news in the Star Wars galaxy and see where the conversation goes. It's usually the best way for us. Are we going but, to do um, the usual celebration thing and sitting down at the table with two minutes to go and say, right, what's the show going to be about? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Well, you know, this show that you do, Brian, you diligently research and prep and plan, make images and, and do all the hard work. You are the anomaly of Fanta Tracks, I've got to say. Hats <laughs> off to you. Yeah, well, 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 we'll, we'll park that one, I think. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, Saturday night, we're going to be on the sail barge to celebration, um, sailing up and down the River Thames, um, as a uh, hosting a bit of a party um all the groups the costuming groups are all involved with and uh um, 236 people i think are going to be on the barge that's a that's a good number of people uh that's not keen of five numbers of people i'm very much looking forward to that you know uh, going up and down the thames is fun anyway uh so to do that would be cool especially at night yeah. and with a bunch of Star Wars people with you know there's there's food on there there's a bit of music on there might even be a couple of cocktails on there who knows um, so yeah, very much looking forward to that. It's going to be fun. Yeah, and uh, hopefully we don't all end up in the sarlacc at the end of it. Uh, <laughs> Let's hope not. <laughs> then on the Sunday night, um, Cantina Two is taking place over at the O2 Indigo, at the O2 <laughs> um, just across the water from uh, the Excel. And uh, Father Tracks are going to be hosting the VIP after party, and uh, you'll be there buying drinks for everyone. I hear. Uh, apparently, somebody once said this on a on a live stream on a Sunday night. Apparently, I'm buying drinks for everyone. I, I will agree to buy the first drink, not for everyone. Just the first if drink. you go up to Mister Newbold and you say that you watch Good Morning Tatooine, he'll buy you a drink. <laughs> <laughs> I might be out to stretch for that. Come on, yeah, well, yeah, that that'll keep the numbers down. Uh, <laughs> and uh, we're going to be part of um, the costuming group area as well on the show floor alongside. Rebel Region, Mando Merck, Saber Guild, Dark Empire, Galactic Academy. And uh, just along from us will be the 501st and Jedi News as well. That's right. That's right. That That's fascinating. The, the maps are starting to come out now. It's on the app. You, you'll be able to see the sort of the rough, well, more than the rough, but the layout of, of where things are on the maps now on the app uh, on the, for iPhones and for Androids as well. And, uh, yeah, it's it's really is, like you say, starting to shape up now. Uh, I'm very much looking forward to that area. I think it's going to be really cool for us. Good spot. Yep. Um, Jonathan there in the chat asking uh, the question if Celebration Europe's going to be live to watch. He knows the Celebrations of America were live. So it is. There's going to be a live stage at the show. If you go to the Celebration site and look at the panels, you can actually see what's going to be on the live stage. The Friday's pretty blank, so it looks like Friday's going to be the day of surprises. Um, they are going to show some panels. I haven't said what historically they've shown some of the main panels not all of them and of the main panels that they have showed they've sometimes cut away from things like trailers or footage that they don't necessarily want to have online at this stage so yes it'll be there live to watch i think you may get some frustrations that it's not the things you necessarily want to see but um yeah um, i think you'll get to see 99 percent of um what you would hope to um, if you're in America you're going to have to get up early though because it's going to be 11am um, UK time so um, set your alarm clocks I think for Friday morning <laughs> um, it's, always, it's always fun isn't it I think it's always fun when they do these live streams and I think what we've done in the past as, as a team is that we've, we've focused on the live streams kind of not, not considering that everybody in the in the galaxy can see the live stream with the main events. So I think we'll be uh, giving some focus to the smaller panels as well around yeah. the event. So uh, hopefully you'll get the full breadth of, of celebration as best as you can without being there by following Fanta Tracks. Yep. Um, Andrew there as well said it's a shame that Steve Sansweet's not going to be there. He announced this week just confirming that uh, Rancho Obi-Wan and himself won't be at the show. But um, lots going on at Rancho and we're hoping to get out there ourselves later in the year. Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. I don't know what their plans are for the, for later this year, but I just want to get over there to see the place. It's been too long. We had a good time there, a good six or seven years ago now. Um, so it'd be fun for us to get to that side of the uh, side of the states again sometime soon. I've never and had even a chance. Then... I've never had a chance to get a tour from Steve round round it, and uh, so that's on my list of things I'd like to do. So I'd certainly want to head out there yeah. at some point to get that tour if possible. Sounds like a plan. Yeah, we should do it. Um, 
terms of panels, you're going to be involved in one on Friday morning. If nobody wants to know what's happening on the world of Star Wars movies and TV, they can come and see you. Um, Sander as well is going to be there. Jeanette Diaz and James Floyd. And you're doing a Star Wars tourism visit in the galaxy far, far away on Earth. And uh, something we've had a lot of fun doing over the years is going to weird and wacky um, Star Wars locations. And you've been to quite a few of them, Mr. Newbold. Yes, seen a few. I've been very fortunate to see a good number. And uh, Matt, who did the panel last year at Anaheim, had seen uh, a crazy amount as well. Uh, we've been fortunate enough to have done Fincer and, and different places as a team. So, yeah, we've been very lucky. Uh, I think uh, being the, the resident Brit out of that bunch, I think I'll be probably looking at uh, UK locations, which, which I have done articles for Insider, um, looking at sort of the classic Star Wars locations in the UK. And there's more than people realise. I, I would... I would Put a good finger on saying that uh, the UK, the British Isles, is probably uh, the number one location outside of studios for for live action Star Wars. So there's been a surprising amount. Yeah. Uh, straight off the back of yourself and um, your co-host on making tracks, Mel Mel Caster will be over on the collector stage and um, presenting along with Greg Alonso and Phil Parker, the well dressed collectors collecting through costume and cosplay panel. Um, <clears throat> everything you could possibly want to know about cosplay and uh, from some of the top guys in the Rebel Legion there. Yeah, Mark talks about it on Making Tracks quite a lot, how, how he'll buy pieces for costumes and then realise how kind of cool they are when they're not deconstructed into becoming a Star Wars thing, but keeping keeping them as they are. Um, so, yeah, I think that that's the focus of that panel is kind of you can collect, but collect in, in with the view of costuming as well, not just collecting costumes but the bits that go into them so it's a it's a very clever concept so i'm looking forward to uh if not seeing it then hopefully seeing it later because it is pretty pretty hot on the heels of our panel yeah jonathan they're just saying that he's based in the uk watched a lot of the last celebration um from america on youtube i was actually in the same boat um last celebration it was the first time i hadn't been able to get to celebration since um celebration two and um so that was an, a different experience for me, and uh, I think we got to see 95% of what I wanted to see. Um, yeah. The most frustrating part being there was a great um, Doug Chang panel, which was incredibly fascinating and in-depth and the kind of thing I kind of enjoy. And the cutaway to the live stage, just for you, McGregor, to say, come and get your autograph, I've got some time just now. <laughs> <laughs> and it was just like <laughs> the most inappropriate thing to put out in the live stream. It just, uh, yeah... Come, come, come and get my autograph when we're all sitting at home watching you on YouTube. <laughs> it was just like it didn't work, <laughs> but yeah. So um, yeah, there's. Down, I think you'll still be able to enjoy a lot of the experience online, and I think certainly sure. that's their intention. There's a big team um, from StarWars.com there to try and give you the best flavor of the show as they possibly can. I think if for those that can't attend, um, if you are there and. Uh, Again on the Friday, a lot of Fanta tracks and um, people presenting on the Friday. Um, Richard Hutchinson, Andy P Preston, Jason Smith, Andrew Horton, Peter Davis doing best of British eccentric vintage collectibles from Blighty um, over on the collector stage. Um, this is going to be a fun panel. I like these things when you you get stuck in like the the quirky aspects of Star Wars and collecting. And uh, these guys have an insane amount of knowledge about. Um, collecting and very much quirky stuff so yeah if you, yeah. If you uh, want to find out some of the weird and wonderful things that have come out in the british market um this is a panel for you yeah totally yeah like you say uh rich has written for us for a long time he co-hosts collecting tracks hopefully there'll be an episode this friday if not this friday then next friday and uh, andy's written for us before in the past and all the guys there they're a good bunch we see them regularly at events like echo live and uh far this from so they're a good good crowd and that will and, and and it's a UK focused panel and we're at Celebration Europe. So things like this make me personally make me very happy to see. Yeah. So this that's, is a, that's this, what the kind of content you want to see, I think. Yeah, totally. Um Bounty Hunters is a big thing at the moment with the Mandalorian Book of Boba Fett. Um our very own social media guru, Mr. Matt Booker, uh, was gonna be on the university stage on the Saturday between six and seven. Um, for bounty hunters, smugglers and gangsters, the scum and villainy through the years. I'm sure Matt's playing the, the, the scum part there. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, 
a few of the guys there from Star Wars Underworld as well, another great site. Um, Adam Christopher, of course, the Star Wars author. And um, uh, everything you can possibly want to know about uh, Bounty Hunters, I think, is going to be on the agenda there. This should be fascinating. Like I say, there's, there's so much you can talk about in in universe out of universe collecting is there's a whole swathe of stuff i put those that picture on because i just thought it looked cool but um yeah having matt on there is going to be interesting because clearly he's going to sway towards the fet yeah it's always going to be fair <laughs> um <laughs> star wars music's your thing um head over to the galactic senate stage which is going to be on the the main show floor um for Carl Bayless and Greg Robertson on Saturday at 5.30 to 6.30 and um, they're going to bring uh, Desert Planet Discs to the li live on stage um, everything you can possibly want to know about Star Wars music and I think they're going to have a focus on the Return of the Jedi in the show as well um, and joining them uh, Mark Hamilton from the Irish rock band Ash um, Toby Jepson, Little Angels, Wayward Sons, Julie Dolan Star Wars voice actor and musician and Emily Dolan Davies um, came well Brian Ferry and many, many more. Um, yeah, they've had some awesome guests on that show. They've really had yeah. some awesome guests. I believe Mark's going to be there at the show as yeah. far as I understand. And they're going to, like you say, they're going to focus on Jedi because it's it's fan it's fan made music. Uh, and if you listen to Desert Planet Discs, which everybody listening to this should because it's awesome, uh, they really go really go to town finding the most interesting music uh, and just the amount of different i think uh, carl was saying on the last episode that he found a, a playlist on on spotify or something it was like 10 hours of different fan-made cantina band music i think it drove him a little bit more bonkers than he already is so they'll go <laughs> they'll really go you know they'll really go deep dive into stuff and yeah like you say the focus for this one is return of the jedi i'm, I'm chuffed to bits that the guys are doing something yeah. at celebrate and of course if you're heading to uh, Cantina 2 on the Sunday uh, Mark Hamilton from Ash will be there playing um, Greg as well will be um, in his alter ego of Darth Elvis um, for his last um, live stage performance as well so don't miss that Heartbroken it's the last Darth Elvis gig Yeah uh, Next up your own show Mr Newbold uh, Start Your Engines along with Paul Naylor um, on the Holonet news stage which is upstairs um, Sunday 2.30 to 3.30 um, and uh, you're going to be talking the Lamba class shuttle um, which I sh meant to share with you but I didn't so I'm fairly funny video <laughs> this week um, of Darth Vader coming out of the Lamba class shuttle and uh, you need to send me that link. they changed the music um, to like a love song and it just works, <laughs> so, just works so perfectly for the scene <laughs> so I'll need to find it, dig it out and send it to you. Please do, please do. Looking forward to this. It's the first time Start Your Engines has been on the uh, Celebration podcast stage. We're a new show anyway. We're only a few episodes in. But, uh, yeah, Paul's an enthusiastic co-host. Uh, and we go as much into the memories of these vehicles and the toys and, you know, that side of it, memories from reading them in comics, as much that as the technical stuff, uh, which can be a little dry, but uh, certainly Paul is anything but dry. So, uh, yeah, hopefully we'll have a good fun hour with that one. Uh, keeping you busy on the Sunday, you'll be back just a couple hours later for Making Tracks Live, which you've done more than a few shows of now. Um, and uh, you'll be there with uh, Mark Melcaster as well, bringing all your usual anarchy. <laughs> <laughs> fanarchy. We're fans, fanarchy. it's fanarchy. Get it right. So, yes, yeah, it's the third time we've done Making Tracks Live, but the first time I've been able to do it at Celebration with Mark. So I'm very much looking forward to that. And we will, as you astutely pointed out, pretty much make it up before we go on stage because we're very reactive on making tracks. It's what's going on right now. So if there's big reveals earlier in the convention or even literally before we walk on stage, we'll probably be talking about it. We want as much crowd interaction as possible. We do tend to like to get out there with the microphone and uh, and take it to people as well as, uh, you know, just sitting there and discussing it. So very much looking forward to that. And, uh, yeah, Making Tracks Live, it will be a good one. Looking forward to that very much. And then on the Monday, um, Planet Leah with Claire Henry and Johanna as well over on the Holonet news stage. And uh, they'll be talking everything for the anniversary of Return of the Jedi with a focus on the female characters, which um, when you consider the um, some of the female characters from that film, um, very prominent at the moment in the uh, Star Wars storytelling. 
Very true. Yeah, very true. It's, it's a good subject matter to pick. Obviously, Jedi 40th is, is our focus. Uh, it should be everybody's focus at this event, really, but uh, it's certainly the girls' uh, focus. Uh, the latest episode of uh, Planet Leia came out yesterday, as we speak. It was a day late. We just missed our Friday night rotation, but that's life. So, uh, yeah, so uh, check that one out. It's their last one as well before celebration. But, uh, again, it's a, it's a debut for Planet Leia on the podcast stage, hopefully first of many. Yeah. And uh, good morning, Tatooine, as well. Ourselves will be on the Holonet news stage as well on Saturday at 11 a.m. So same time as Ahsoka. So nobody worries about animation. I've said this before. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, join me. Um, Star Wars author Adam Christopher will be joining us. We'll be discussing everything about um, his stories he's brought to the Star Wars galaxy. Um, Florian Bauer as well from, I'm going to pronounce this correctly because it's not pronounced as you imagine. It's Yidi Bibliotech. Ah. See, there you go. I'll, I'll have to get it right before celebration. And uh, right. he also runs the Star Wars Books Twitter handle as well, which is very popular and very informative yeah. on books and comics. And along with me will be Matt Booker as well. And uh, we'll be discussing all the breaking news. So we'll be right up to date on Saturday morning. We'll be with everything announced on Friday. We'll be discussing what we found on the first day on the show floor. We'll have competitions and games and everything, and uh, it'll be an exciting show. And uh, it will. It's, it's a debut for you as well, isn't it? On the uh, debut, on the debut for celebration, but we're used to doing it live, <laughs> so it there shouldn't go it. too long. <laughs> and can I just say, can I just give my condolences to Adam Christopher for having to do two panels in one day with Matt Booker? Yeah. Um, that, that's that's just, as long as you go. That's that's just, just. I'm sorry, Adam. Yeah. Andrew's yeah. asking if any of these panels are ticketed. None of the Father Tracks panels are ticketed. We'll let you in. Don't worry. No. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That, that that'll be room. Yeah. Out with the sort of the big four morning shows. So basically, your um, your Lucasfilm showcase, um, your Ahsoka panel, your Bad Batch panel which I think is the Monday, and your villains panel with uh, Hayden and uh, um, Ian McDermott. Demons. I think they're the, they're the four. There's the Obi-Wan panel as well. I think the fifth one's was added. Um, they're the five ticketed events. Everything else up is a case of queuing. Um, <clears throat> if there is a panel you want to attend, do turn up early, though, because uh, um, if you think it's going to be popular... Um, Make sure you're there at good good time before the panel starts to make sure you can get in. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, as well as all the own panels, also highly recommend the uh, collecting track as well. Gus Lopez has been doing um, the collecting track for a long, long um, time. And uh, there's medallions to collect as well if you attend as many of the panels as you can. And uh, always great panels. Um over on the collecting track, Mr. Newbold. Absolutely, absolutely. I uh, I think they've updated the, the the medallions now. I think there's 20. Uh, I think they've revealed 18 at the last time I checked. Yep. Uh, the picture there is front and back, so they've only revealed the front of some, not the backs, which is hence the gaps. But, yeah, the collecting track, I mean, it's been there. I, I did a bit of history on this, and when Celebration 1 happened in Denver in 99, uh, Gus approached Steve Sansweet and said, is there going to be anything about collectors? And Steve went, well, no, but, you know, you've got two weeks to plan something. And Gus being Gus pulled it a collecting track basically together in two weeks. And it's been there ever since. So uh, it's it's as essential a part of celebration as literally as anything else. So, yeah, if you can get to any of those panels and if you can get to the 20 and get all the medallions, you're doing very well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's also products galore coming to celebration as well, including things that we don't often get in the UK then. Um, some vendors um, come to the UK for the first time. I sort of mentioned, you know, Anova in the um, start, but um, also Heroes, Heroes and Villains are bringing their range to the UK. And um, not a range I was particularly familiar with, but I was seeing a lot of comment about it um, in the celebration groups as to whether they were coming to the show or not. So um, clearly more informed people than me out there and uh, what, what in this range. So I reckon they're going to be very successful at the show. And a uh, number of products as well um, in their range. And uh, 
So very stylish. I'm 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 questioning some of the modelling. It's a bit cheesy for my liking, but the products look good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm quite tempted to pick myself up a, a new backpack and I'm liking the look of some of the backpacks that they've got yes. on offer. Yeah, that, that backpack's very smart. I do like the orange jumper as well. It's a bit loud, but I like knitted wear, so it's very cool. Yeah. And uh, uh, maybe I should uh, go for something like the, the hat and scarf because it's, what is it, the first day of summer officially today? Clocks have gone forward. And That's it right. was snowing. <laughs> <laughs> You're kidding. No, not at all. And uh, yeah, this is the backpack coming up that I was kind of looking at. It's kind of a oh, little bit okay. subtle, but kind of nice. That is nice. So products galore available at Celebration Heroes and Villains. Just one of the companies that's going to be there. There's going to be a lot um, of things to buy. And uh, as well as that, um, there's a charity aspect that we're going to be involved in. Um we're supporting the costuming groups um, the 501st of Droid Builders, Galactic Academy, Mando Merch, Rebel Legion, Sabre Guild and the Dark Emperor and uh, we're going to be supporting them along with uh, Jedi News and uh, one of the things we're going to be doing across the show is um, One Galaxy, One Goal raising money for Make-A-Wish UK and uh, so we'll be pushing that um, throughout the month of April and especially at the show um, Head to the sort of the Koshman Group area, and you'll be able to donate to Make a Wish an incredible charity there as well. That's right. Yeah, we'll we'll support those guys as best we can with uh, getting the uh, the signal boost out there, and uh, hopefully do a few more bits here on Fantha and definitely at the show as well. Um, hoping to do a making tracks this week with Mark. Mark has been insanely busy, which is why you may have noticed we've not done quite so many episodes as we normally do over the last couple of weeks. But uh, we're hoping to do something tomorrow, which will be our last episode before celebration as well. And I'm sure Mark will give us uh, a lot more information about uh, this uh, Galaxy United project uh, for Make-A-Wish. Yeah. And uh, if you want to donate, scan the QR code on the screen. Or to make life easy, if you want to go to fathertracks.com forward slash one galaxy, that'll take you straight through to the Make a Wish page as well. And uh, just prior to celebration, we mentioned it at the head of the show, Boot Naive, um, the fourth Boot Naive is coming. They've announced more guests, um, including us. Obviously, we're all going to be there. But um, <laughs> more importantly, if you're looking for people's autographs, I'm sure you don't want ours. It's uh, Richard Stride. Um, who was Poggle the Lesser from Attack of the Clones, and uh, Andrew Lodden, who was a newbie guard from the Phantom Menace. So if you're a fan of the prequels, an opportunity to get two more signatures added to your collection. Um, you're looking forward to the virtual cantina's Winter Eve. Oh, big time. Yeah, big time. I mean, they've, they've done a, a grand job of bringing some guests into the show, which is kind of what they're known for from the first three Boonters. And uh, so, yeah, some good guests there. Richard Stride's a great guest. Andrew Lord, we see around here uh, a lot in the UK at different events. He was also uh, Liam Neeson standing, I believe, on Phantom. But uh, with this week's episode of Mandalorian, Naboo guards, they're kind of back in, aren't they? So it was well timed. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, one of the big events um, organised for the fans at Celebration um, on the evening of Sunday is uh, Cantina 2. Tickets are st still available. Um, go to that tiny arrow there, um, or if you go to fathertracks.com, you'll see the, the banners up on the site, all over the site as well. Um, they've added their final signing guest, in, uh, Dave Chapman, who is B2 Emo's voice actor and also the droid operator from Andor. He's going to be signing at the event. They've got quite an incredible array of signing guests that you won't be able to get at Celebration Unique to just Cantina. Again, if you're a, if you're a, an autograph hunter, if that's your thing, then you're really going to fill your boots between Boone to Celebration and Cantina. And uh, both teams have done a bang up job of bringing some really interesting guests. Dave Chapman, to my mind, why he's not at Celebration utterly evades me. But I'm really pleased that Cantina have hopped onto that and made that happen. And yeah, uh, yeah some uh, some real good opportunities there. And I think I don't know if it's been uh, uh, I don't know if I've got around to putting it on Fanta yet, but Brian Herring is the host of Cantina. As well, it was announced on the Ash live stream earlier this week, uh, yeah. so Brian will be there as well. Fantastic, and uh, tickets still available. And uh, as I say, if you mentioned Good Morning Tatooine to Mark, he'll buy you a drink as well at the after party. <laughs> oh, glad the camera's not on me. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll have to bring a camera back on you. <laughs> <at that point. laughs> 
The uh, looking forward to Cantina because obviously magic array of signing guests as well, but obviously the music's the key focus of that show, and it's um, the last Cantina was something quite epic, and uh, lots of big plans in place for this one. Yeah, they've really pushed the boat out, and and now everything's been announced. We put a piece on the site that was kind of like the final post about what's what's you know what's officially happening, but the hope not the expectation that's too too much but the hope is that there'll be some you know some other faces that sort of uh, there attending the show uh, that uh, you've just got to be there to see it kind of thing so yeah i think uh, cantina could be really special like like you say the first one was yep and uh stepping away from celebration for a little while um towards the mandalorian um we are at week number four of mandomania have you been going manic for mandalorian um, if you have lots of products in store again this week from Hasbro Gentle Giant and uh, the like, um, first up, very appropriately, yeah. Paz, Paz Vizsla from Gentle Giant, um, limited to only 3,000 pieces, a six inch mini bust, um, which looks quite impressive. It does. I wouldn't want to carry that up a mountain there. No, <laughs> no, indeed. <laughs> um, Stepping back in time a little bit to the book of Boba Fett and uh, Hasbro and their vintage collection have released uh, or are releasing Cad Bane. I really do like the look of this. This this figure looks... I, I may well hop onto this, um, scoot down to all the cool stuff and get that. And just, just an interesting aside, because I know we've pushed for time, but I've got to say, I found out recently that Dorian Kinji, who played Cad Bane in the book of Boba Fett, his mom is Lindsay Wagner, who was the bionic woman, and I had no idea. There you go. And, that, and that's why Cad Bane himself is bionic. Clearly. Clearly. There's a heritage <laughs> there. There you go. Um, continuing the uh, Book of Boba Fett theme, you can also get uh, Little Grogu with Luke Skywalker. And uh, I, I, I picked that one purely because it, it looks like he's like cooked, like a... Uh, Yoda's head, and he's about to feed it to baby Grogu. <laughs> As I say, is that, is that a KFC? <laughs> <laughs> it looks that way. Uh, I picked that image purely for that. It's available for pre order at Hasbro Pulse Amazon and all the other um, retailers that you may expect it to be. Um, yeah. Jonathan asked a question if uh, Sam Whitner's going to be at Celebration. Um, he met him at Monopoly events in Liverpool. Um, don't believe he's on the list. I haven't seen his um, name at all. No, me neither. No, there doesn't seem to be a huge amount of voice actors. There's a few, yeah. Um, but I've not seen Sam. Um, maybe they're saving him for 2025. Yeah, and uh, not a huge push on the gaming side either, which obviously um, Sam was um, heavily yeah. involved in the, on the gaming side of things and for Star Wars as well. And uh, um, not seeing a huge push on that side of things in terms of panels and content which is also a little oh, bit surprising. True. Especially given what's uh, literally around the corner, yeah. Yeah. Uh, again, Cad Bane this time um, on the Vintage Collection. Uh, 1699 um, coming in autumn of this year. Um, and we have um, Ahsoka Tano added to the Lightsaber Forge Collection as well with our white lightsaber. Really, should be you need to buy two of them, don't you? I guess I get. Well, yeah, I mean, lightsaber forge is cool because you can kind of change the hilts and stuff. Lightsaber forge is basically what our little Fanta is holding on the main Fanta logo. If you take a close look, it's basically the same saber. Okay, I never noticed that. I'll have to have a look. Yeah. Um, need something for work. Um, some cufflinks. This is a way little baby Yoda. Um, Grogu cufflinks by. Who else but cufflinks? <laughs> <laughs> oh, it does what it says on the tin. It these does. are really cute. I like these. I think these are very yeah. smart. I just need some cups. I would have preferred um, what they've got in the stud um, to be the main image and have this as a way underneath, but that's just me. I, th I think Matt might disagree. <laughs> <laughs> um, Lego's your thing. Lego's always bang up to date, so they're bang up to date with uh, uh, the Mandalorian. And uh, they've got the N1 Starfighter with uh, Din Djarin and Grogu in there. These microfighters are really cool. They've been around for a good long while now, but they are very smart. 
Yeah. And last on the Mandomania reveals for this week. This is the way stud set by Girls Crew as well. Yeah. That's that's lovely. Especially the N one. That's that's the winner there for me. The N one is is worth it just just for that for me. Yeah. And whilst we're talking products, do you know Inovu um announcing their Rogue One Cassinander jacket? Um designed um against uh, the production assets from Rogue One as well, so it's you're not going to get anything more screen accurate than that. And uh, yeah. Gino and Novu will be at celebration for the first time as well. Yeah, great news that they're coming over, and uh, I think we get a lot of messages on Fanta uh, regarding De Niro Novu. Uh, with people confusing them still, understandably, and I think De Niro know this, confusing them with the Novos. And we do our best to sort of set the record straight in that they're not the same company. They're honouring their orders. And now they're moving beyond the orders that were sort of set out by uh, a Novos. And, yeah, fantastic. If you're uh, into costuming, if you're just a fan and you want to wear a cool jacket, you know, this is the one to look for. And it's not, I can't remember the price off the top of my head. I think it was a couple of hundred. It wasn't a crazy amount, oh, okay. 250 something like that. Two fifty rings a bell. Yeah. And uh, so that's all the product announcements for this week, which is um, a nice selection there. If you had to pick up one, what one would you go for? Ah, uh, that's a good question. Um, I, I did think the cufflinks were cute, and I really did weirdly like the the N one. Uh, I think it was an earring, wasn't it? So I, I would yeah. probably go for that, just because I think it would look kind of cute on the uh, on the shelf, and it's small, and I like uh, smaller collectibles because I can fit them in my room. <laughs> um, on the gaming front I mentioned not much happening in celebration gaming wise but as you said we do have um, Jedi Survivor right on the cusp of coming out in April um, so they may surprise us and have a, something very nice on the show floor we don't know um, but they released um, a story trailer this past week so let's bring that up don't worry about the language, people, because we're, we're running it without sound. But um, this is a um, story trailer for Jedi Survivor, and it kind of got social media talking because um, mm. a few High Republic elements in there, some costumes on Jedi with the, the High Republic um, design. They're doing a good job of working this whole Republic stuff into the broader canon without forcing it down our throats. It always felt a little bit when... Um, Galaxy's Edge was coming along. It did feel quite overt, overly overt. I think they've found an, a nicer balance with uh, High Republic because it's it's an important era and a, and a big era as well. But this, uh, I never played um, Fallen Order. I'm not a massive gamer and certainly not good enough to uh, to even hope to to get very far through something like this. But uh, it is it is quite uh, an interesting uh, thing to watch. Um, I, I will probably end up watching one of my friends play it and be quite happy to do that. Uh, also, soon, very soon, hopefully, uh, we'll be speaking to Sam Maggs, who's written the uh, Battle Scars novel. Uh, so, fingers crossed, we'll have that coming uh, reasonably soon as well, which, of course, ties in with this. Yeah. And uh, I'm kind of a mild gamer, I think. And uh, I haven't invested in, in sort of next generation consoles. So I'm at this point. Do I get one just so I can play Jedi Survivor? Because it's yeah. not coming to PS4. Um, what do I go? Do I go PS5? Do I go Xbox? And I say that because I've, I've mentioned this many times, but Elder Scrolls, Skyrim's my thing. And I've been playing it for a decade and more and still play it uh, most weeks at some point. <laughs> and um, they've obviously been bought by Microsoft. And so you're looking more oh. towards Xbox, you see, for that okay. moving forward. Yeah. And, uh, I don't know what to do. Don't know what to do. <laughs> so if if EA is there, I might be speaking to them and asking them, what should I do? <laughs> PlayStation or <laughs> Xbox? Um, yeah. But there we go. Um, you make a good point about them being on the show floor. You'd like to think there'll be, <coughs> excuse yeah. me, there'll be something something yeah. there to do. EA has done some great things on the show floor at Star Wars celebrations in the past. Um, Anakin Chris been asking there in the comments. Um, it would be nice to get an update on either. Eclipse or the Knights of the um, Old Republic remake that are also happening. Um, yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm surprised there's not a big gaming panel with lots of updates on various games. Um, and uh, he's also playing Fallen Order again before the new game comes out. And he's looking forward to picking up Battle Scars as well. 
And uh, there uh, we go. Mm-hmm. There's one suggestion from him as well. He's buying the Xbox just for Jedi Survivor. So I might have to go that way. It's going to be controversial. <laughs> I've always been a Sony guy since first PlayStation. Wow. And I still have them all. I still have all four of them. <laughs> oh, well played. Nice one. I've still got my PlayStation 2, and I've got the four at the moment. I had the three, but I sold it to a friend because he needed a Blu-ray player. There you go. It's yeah. a very good Blu-ray player. It's still, I still use it yeah. as my Blu-ray player of choice. <laughs> um, so Jedi Survivor is coming out late April. Um, hope to find out more about its celebration. We just don't know. Um, but something that we should be finding out a lot more celebration about is um, Skeleton Crew. I'm sure that's going to be part of the Lucasfilm showcase on Friday. Um, Jude Law fronted show. Um, and uh, the Daniels, Daniel Kwan and Daniel Schneider. I'm going to say this terribly. Scheinert, Scheinert. How yep, is, how is it? Yeah, sounds about right. Um, we'll run with that. Um, they're going to be directing an uh, upcoming episode of Skeleton Crew. It's coming to Disney Plus, I think, next year. I think there's a plan for Skeleton Crew, but I could be wrong. Could be the tail end of this year. And uh, just uh, hot in the bag of having picked up three Oscars for everything everywhere, which um, everything everywhere all at once. Um, best Picture, Best Director and Best Original Screenplay so excited that they're going to be involved in a Star Wars project kind of came a little bit out of the blue although they did admit themselves that um, they needed it so they could keep their green cards <laughs> need, to <get> those, <laughs> need to get those hours hours in <laughs> Well there's no guarantee you're going to win an Oscar so it's it's all kind of worked out very nicely for them hasn't it and that, that film was so, so out there I, I tell people when I recommend it to them don't expect logic, don't expect you know, uh, a, a logically regular structured film. This is something else, and it really is something else. But, uh, yeah, to see them coming to that, um, it's going to be fascinating. And, yeah, I think you're right. Uh, I would imagine on that Lucasfilm Showcase panel on the Friday, which, of course, will be half empty because everybody will be at my locations panel, of course. Yeah. Um, there should be some some good reveals, hopefully a bit of indie, indie uh, Dial of Destiny stuff as well. So it yeah. um, should be a good panel. Jonathan's putting a vote in for Sony for me there, but he also makes a great point that Skeleton Crew is going to be something different. And yeah. I kind of think out of everything that they're doing Star Wars wise, Skeleton Crew could be the surprise um, success out of it all. Um, it's yeah. going to link back to Ahsoka and Mando because it's all kind of on its own little universe there. And I've kind of suggested where I think it's going to link back in previous Good Morning Tatooines, or I've made my predictions. Um, we don't know. We'll find out. Maybe at celebration. And um, but yeah, I think it could be the surprise hit series, kind of coming from the left field a little bit. Yeah, well, kid focused. They've sort of said they were going for that eighties Goonies vibe. John Watts is just in the Spider Man trilogy. You know, it's it's all set up to succeed. So hopefully they'll uh, knock it out of the park. Yeah, and that kind of came out of nowhere. Nobody kind of expected that announcement. Um, it, I think it was D23, wasn't it? It was announced. and um, So that we could get uh, another wild Star Wars TV show announcement that we don't expect um, at Celebration. You never know. Um, there is other ones dangling out there in the wind, that, um, such as Lando that was kind of announced. Um, and uh, the Droid Tales um, animation yeah. as well. Um, though I'm not too fussed about that myself. <laughs> it's like <laughs> combining the two things. I don't like droids and animation. <laughs> but um, yeah, what I really want to hear about at Celebration is what's happening on the movie front because Star Wars does belong on the big screen. And uh, the week kind of started with, um, I don't know if we can call it surprising news anymore, but creatives leaving their role. Um Damon Lindelof, Justin Britt Gibson um, ended their tenure um, being attached to what's currently being known as uh, the untitled Star Wars movie. Um, and Peaky Blinders' own Stephen Knight um, quickly moved into position and the project's going to continue but with a different writer. Um, all sorts of rumours that the Lucasfilm just weren't happy with um, the Lindelof script. Um, and that there was clashes between him and the director and the vision for what they wanted it to be. We just don't know, is the, is the truth of the matter. And uh, I think sometimes we make too much of people joining and leaving projects because it is a common trait across Hollywood. Yeah. Um, but the interesting thing is, 
Um, and the undeniable thing is that when you've got publications like uh, Vanity Fair, which is effectively a trade publication, when they're reporting it, they're now listing off all the talent that have left uh, Lucasfilm Productions. So there does seem to be this air within the industry now as well that um, the reputation, I don't know if you can call it reputation, but um, there's a... Hmm, I'm trying to find the right word. There's a element uh, of concern as to what's happening at Lucasfilm mm. about these projects um, to get them from concept to screen. I think that's fair. I think that's fair. I don't think anybody would particularly uh, raise an eyebrow at that as, as a statement. It does seem to have been uh, a problem uh, and a problematic ongoing situation. This one, it feels very much like... Um, and I'm, forgive me, his name's gone totally out of my head, the guy that did the first run at, um, at Rogue One, uh, and, and, and other writers came in and picked it up. And, it's you know, it's a fairly common thing that, that these, hello, Jack, it's a fairly common thing that these things happen, you know, that, that one writer will have a pass at it, another writer will come in and, and carry on. And, you know... Gary, and it, and Gary all, White. Gary, Gary White. yeah, well done. Yeah, yeah Gary, yeah. It will just work along to, to sort of come to where it needs to be. And a lot of those writers, and I'm assuming... Yeah, and Lindelof made a really nice statement, really. It was kind of vague and then followed up quickly by Knight being announced or being mentioned to be doing it, uh, sort of saying, you know, when you love something this much, you kind of want to see it be awesome as much as the next guy. Yeah. And I don't want to be the guy that doesn't make it the awesome thing, so I'd kind of rather step away. So it kind of felt like it didn't read like there was any issue. It just felt like he took it as far as he felt like he could and then bring another fresh set of eyes into yeah pick out of that and, you know, move it forward. So I don't think that this one didn't feel like a drama thing to me. No. But could be wrong. Could be but, wrong. Um, I guess my concern is that they seem to pick a director and they seem to pick a writer and they don't have a concept. It's almost like they're giving yeah. them a blank slate. I don't think that works. Yeah. I think as the production house, you need to have the concept. Then you need to find the right writer to bring that concept to screen, then you need to find the right director for that script. 100% so, agree. Um, I kind of feel like they're doing things in the wrong direction. It's like, we really want to work with this writer and we really want to work with this director. Um, and they're bringing them in and maybe not attaching them to the right projects. Or It certainly feels like, and none of us will ever know, we can only ever speculate, but it certainly feels like that um, Lucasfilm aren't connecting on the same wavelength as some of these people that are bringing in and it just feels how is that possible because surely you have a conversation at this point that you're signing the contract is this is what we want you to do kind of thing and it, it doesn't feel like that's happening it feels like the creative are leading and then Lucasfilm's looking at it and saying no that's not what we want yeah yeah it, it does feel a bit more like I can tell you what I don't want yeah. quicker than I can tell you what I do want yeah, so I mean, I think with a sandbox like Star Wars, it's it's enormous, of course, but it's so easy. We know this as fans, and anyone who's yeah. ever written fanfic and, and paid attention to what they're writing will know. You know, you make one error of judgment, if you want to call it that, and a lot of other things just sort of start tumbling down. It's very tightly interwoven. So I think, really, like you say, that always felt like that's what not. I know that's not what the story group's for. I think people conflate and, and mis it sort of confuse exactly what that's for and I don't think it's clearly defined anyway but, but but you would think that they would say like you say you know John Knoll says let's tell the story of how they stole the Death Star plans and out comes Rogue One well that makes all the sense because it ties in to fit you know it's a fixed thing it makes some sort of sense but if you just go I really like X director and X writer let them just have at it you know yeah you could be setting some cool stuff up like I don't know, Favreau with Mandalorian and, and you've set up a new era in a big blank chunk of space and now we can kind of see as it's moving forward it's starting to move towards other elements from the, the the sort of the dangling off the start of the sequel trilogy and, you know, great but by the same token yeah, it might not work, it, you know, certain things might not work and I think Lucasfilm like you say, have probably got to a certain point with these projects and gone, ah, that doesn't really that's not, we're not, we're not feeling it well, there should be more of a a firm, you know, um, yeah. idea of where they want to take it. I think but that's kind of where, let's position. call it the Mandoverse. I think that's why it works, is because it's almost become its own self-contained shoebox, yeah. almost kind of thing. Yeah. And out with that, there doesn't seem to be anyone sort of leading 
creative direction. And uh, so it kind of feels like nobody knows the answer is what is Star Wars? Yeah. And um, oh. what what or what do you want Star Wars to be? Yeah, and that's, um, fair. that's fair. And every era has its own feel. You know, every era has its own vibe. It always has. And that, and, and a lot of that is serendipity, kind of things building and folding and such, you know. But that's life, isn't it? The world, the 60s feel different to the 70s. So, you know, it's 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 an understandable thing. But, yeah, yeah you, as long as they, like you say, they've got to find the source, the secret source, and if, if you've got that in there, it'll work. Yeah. And, uh, but certainly something that we can't fault is that, when they deliver, they are delivering. And mm. uh, I think Andor was quite widely um, loved by the fan base. And uh, it's also being recognised um, at um, a production level as well in terms of it's picked up three BAFTA TV awards um, for visual um, special and graphic effects, um, which kind of, I don't know whether I should be surprised by that. I mean, it kind of was because I don't feel like it was a huge visual and graphics effects show it felt very natural uh, but maybe that's why it wins uh, yeah no i think uh, you're right i think you're right there and uh, fiona show also gets a nomination uh, for best supporting actress and editor francis parker also gets a nomination um and i think i'm just going to throw one in there because phil parker makes a great point i think after the poor reception for seven eight and nine by some fans at least um They've almost come risk averse for the films. I think that's probably a very fair point. I think Solo's um, box office kind of shocked it, um, even though yeah. I think Solo is one of the best films they've put out. Yeah. Um, so Anyways. hats off to Andor for its BAFTA nominations. Hopefully they have great success. I've never understood how the editor um, category works because unless you've seen it before it's been edited, how do you know the editing's any good? Wow, that's a really astute observation. Yeah, that's a very good point. I, I, I've, I've always just thought that's like, what's the difference between good and bad editing? Because you don't know what content you've been given to work with in the first place. The only thing, the only thing I can think of is we always, it's always been the thing that Marsha Lucas came in and sort of saved Star Wars in the edit, and and Lucas was always kind of, I, I'm an editor. I just gather the footage and put it together in the in the editing suite sort of thing. Yeah. But it's a very spurious thing to describe to people who don't know what that was before it was put together. But yep. you've heard enough of the pre marsha edit of Star Wars or her portion of the film that she edited that people were like, that people, respected people were like, oh, God, it was horrible. And then they see that version. It's like, oh, wow, actually, that was, that, that really made the film. But so, that's. But that's I've always beyond... taken the opinion that like, people look at it and say, oh, it was horrible before she edited it. Or did they just not have the vision that the person filming it had? True. There is you know? that. We're not, always, we're not all as smart as George. Yeah, I've, I, I say this in many of the categories when I look at it and I always think, I question how they come up with it, where they come up <laughs> with um, uh, best adaptation or, or whatever I can totally get because you've got the original source material to see, okay, how have they adapted that? But um, so many of the categories, it's just like, yeah, how do you judge that one? <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> but there we go. Um, congratulations to them all. Someone knows far better, more informed than I am, that's for sure. Man. And and uh, last on the news front, um, as we try and move quickly on because we're running sh sharp on time, um, <laughs> Ahmed Best came back this week in The Mandalorian. We're just off to talk about The Mandalorian next um, in his role that he played on the kids game show, um, Jedi, Jedi Challenges. Um, he played Kelvin Beck and uh, he's been talking about um, how it felt for him to uh, um, come back and also his desire to do a lot more with the character moving forward. He was very smart, actually. You know, when he when he came up with, I think in the piece it kind of says that he pretty much came up with the character of Keller and for Jedi Temple Challenges and was involved in its creation. And then to be asked to come and do it, I'm waggling the air quotes, properly, you know, in, in, in canon uh, and, and elevate it even more, you know. So we even got down into helping design the costume and, and lots of other things like that. Wow, I mean, yeah, we all know uh, he, he was Jar Jar. He was Ahmed Beck in Attack of the Clones, Kelleran's brother, uh, which was always the cute connection when Jedi Temple Challenges came out three years ago. But but now to be actually back sort of full on and hopefully, you know, there's there's more to follow because he gets out of the episode alive. So hopefully, spoiler alert, so hopefully, you know, there could be more uh, more to see. Plus, 
it was always a good guest at the conventions. Uh, we interviewed him at Wales Comic Con. I say I interviewed him for um, uh, Star Wars Insider, uh, and and he was lovely. Couldn't couldn't be friendlier. Couldn't have given me more time if he you know if he tried. So uh, nothing but positive things to say about the actor. But yeah, to see him back in here, it's a nice. It's a, I'm saying nice. That's a vanilla word, but you know, it's a good link back to the prequel trilogy, which as the years go by, gets more and more sort of love as the fan base grows older and. You know, it's, uh, it's it's a nice throwback. I thought. Yeah, I have my own thoughts, but I'm going to save it until we're doing the review because we're doing the review right now. <laughs> we certainly are. Yeah. So let's let's start. Um, episode kicked off back on the Mandalorian's um, cave. You've got one of the most dynamic groups of bounty hunters with the possibility and great wealth, living in a cave on a planet where they're being attacked by dinosaurs from sea and air <laughs> I, don't, I, 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 have a, I don't know where the logic is behind it but yeah um, they're doing their training and uh, the other thing that annoyed me, they're firing their shots out into the water where they've just been attacked by a monster from the water no much wonder it's attacking you <laughs> it's getting zapped by laser bolts every other second um, but yeah, so it was interesting. They did a nice little training montage through all the different ones, and uh, Bo Katan kind of walked amongst them. And uh, little Grogu was playing down by the water with his little um, alien rocks. And uh, then Jaren sort of came up to him and said, Right, time you get your ass kicked. <laughs> More or Pretty less. Pretty much. Yeah. Pretty much. I, I was disappointed given that Carl Weathers directed this episode that we didn't get the montage music, the training music from Rocky Four. That's that what felt was like needed, a... wasn't it? They needed like a yeah. little running along, flipping over the rocks. and <laughs> That's it. The sweat. Yeah. Grow a beard. It would have been great. Yeah. Um, and uh, he got fed with his little darts in his arm. Looks a little bit concerned there. He does. He does. I mean, as, as a situation for the little guy to be put into... When he's still kind of figuring out the world, which you can see, and he's clearly more with it now than he was before, uh, and he has an awakening, if you want to call it that, in this episode, which we'll get to, but he does seem more alert to things, and almost was asking permission, because I think I think he's savvy enough, even as a, as a kid, savvy enough to see what the Mandalorians do and how they operate. It's right there in front of us, as you just said, with their training sessions, but he has his own, in a very Liam Neeson way, his own particular set of skills and can he use them is he allowed to use them well yeah yeah it's he it's, is. it's a one of two things has he been suppressing his abilities because he's learnt to he has to hide his abilities to yeah hide from the empire or what i think that he's nasty and evil and been killing people and so he's become guilty and no longer uses his power because he's just an evil little thing i love how you think the best of people i do um he got the schoolyard picked on <laughs> um, <laughs> with the two shots there. And we all know where the third shot was going. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, when it looked like he was going to lose, um, he lost the first two rounds. Um, he fought back, fired his thing, cheating because he took three shots in one round. Yeah. How's not, that fair? Not playing by the rules. And... Uh, kid he was fighting obviously took a half walked off and then got um sucked up by this giant flying lizard thing um, <laughs> i think they called it a raptor didn't they so it's it's yeah i think so yeah and uh then and uh paz go after it but interestingly and i thought it was quite a good point um they ran out of fuel for the rockets yeah which was i mean that's um, Unusual Careless. twist, yeah. Um, but you know, quite an interesting plot point. Um, so Bo Katan yeah. chased it down, and and her ship because she had more wise. Let's take my ship instead of my rocket blasters. Um, and she was able to trace it back to its lair, and uh, report back um, to the armorer who still seems to head up this group. You know, the whole sort of community seems to revolve around um, the armorer. Yeah. They've never really gone into any great detail. I think this is yeah. this would be use a useful use of expanded material outside of what you see on screen. You know, an armor a novel or an armor a comic. 
you know, just something to give us a bit of more, a bit more detail into who she is and why she's got the control that she's got. I'm sure we'll get to it in an episode and it'll be flashbacks and blah, blah, blah. But, you know, I do think sometimes I wish they'd sort of loosen the reins a little bit on the, on some of the history of, of these characters. Um, Phil's making a good point there of what exactly um, quote him. But, um, but he doesn't wash his coat by the next episode. I've got this thing for every episode, Grog is dragging his coat through the mud and it never gets dirty. So I'm interested <laughs> to see if the green paint... <laughs> <laughs> remains there or not uh, <laughs> oh, that'd, be if it did. that'd be really funny if it did and uh, we kind of talked about the armourer so whilst um, the armourer sends off um, Bo-Katan and Den and, and Co um, to form a little team to try and recover the kid um, the armourer takes Grogu in her, her little um, welding shop mm. and uh, he watches her doing some welding and uh, as the the noise builds up and the machines start banging and clanging and whatever, he's kind of has this little vision moment, and uh, he flashes back to uh, Order sixty six and a scene we've seen from a few different perspectives a few different times. And uh, the Jedi there kind of sacrifice their lives to save the younglings, and he's one of them that escapes in an elevator. And uh, when he gets to the top of the elevator, this is the face that greets him. Yeah, that was a nice surprise. That was a nice, definitely a nice surprise to see him. And they do name check Kelleran first. And as soon as the name was said, I was like, Kelleran, that's, hang on, that's. And I was trying to pick pull where, where I knew that name from, but I knew that I knew it. And then when that door opened, no, it wasn't Mace Windu. As some people online were hypothesizing that it might be before they saw the episode. Yeah, it was Kelleran Beck. It was Armored Best. So that was very cool. But I didn't anticipate quite what a kick-ass scene we were going to get. Yeah, so we've got a pretty wild sort of like lightsaber scene as he kind of fought against the, the clone troopers um, who obviously Jar Jar Binks um, authorised the Emperor to um, take whatever emergency powers he needed and it was Jar Jar Binks that authorised the purge and the evil nasty Jedi who were trying to upstart the democratically elected Emperor. And uh, so, really, <laughs> Kelleran <laughs> is fighting against Jar Jar Binks' own policy here. Because it was Jar Jar Binks that that's an interesting the, one of... the Purge and the Jedi. And Kelleran's the one that's who resisted it. That's a unique angle, If they were honourable people, the Jedi would hold their hands up and allow themselves to be arrested and placed on trial. But here they are fighting. I, 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 I'm wordless, speechless. <laughs> not what to say. <laughs> so uh, we see the Jedi Temple burn as it should. Nasty, evil Jedi, um, not not allowing <laughs> democracy to be upheld. And we also get um, a chance to see some scenes that we saw um, a couple of episodes back in the Mandalorian yeah. as well, um, which yeah, was a nice was little cool, touch. Actually. Yeah, it was cool to be able to go back there and see that place again, sort of how many years, 30 years before, give or take, we'd seen it in the previous episode. So, yeah, that was a, that was a nice touch. Yeah. Um, Phil's saying there that he wanted them to end the scene by saying, Bombard Jedi. <laughs> 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 uh, and Kelleran takes uh, Grogu uh, by speeder bike across the city um, to his, um, what he quotes as his friends, who were Naboo um, soldiers mm -hmm. who should be listening to uh, their senator, the f aforementioned Palpatine, who is now uh, emperor. So these, out of all the traitors, these are the very worst. Well, he was the senator for Naboo, so that, yep. that is fair comment. I, I'm, I'd love to know exactly where in within Revenge of the Sith this is, because quite a few people have pointed out that Jar Jar had the same ship as Padme did. And I think if, if if you look at the timeline, I think Padme, Anakin and Obi-Wan would already be on their way, if not already at Mustafar at this point, I think. I would have said um, that would be yeah. correct. Yeah. So this this could be Jar Jar's ship. And if can you imagine if we saw Jar Jar next week? Uh that would that would really be something. But uh just to see the Naboo again, just to see those characters and just, just it could the also be Senator Palpatine's ship. 
could be yeah and like you say he's from the boo that's a good point so yeah that would that would be wow that would be a twist wouldn't of it all the places um, to take him that wouldn't be safe would be naboo at this point well a few people have said well maybe he goes to Otto Gunga under the water and that's where he stays my personal theory i'm going to give you my personal theory i think he ends up on dagobah with yoda but i'm just saying that now in case it happens then i sound like a, a very wise person or a fool it's usually a fool but uh, I, I think the, the, the quite potentially, uh, or there's there's fair potential for him. Yes, he, he's he's with them. Although, like you say, it's a bit on the nose if you're in a Naboo starship to go to Naboo. It's not the smartest thing to do. So uh, we'll 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 see. Hopefully, we'll see more flashbacks. But regardless, Kellerin's the one to save him. He his friends. He leaves his friends fighting the five of first clone troopers, um, well, rather, um, and leaves them all behind. To be slaughtered, because that's what you do <laughs> <laughs> to your friends. Um, escapes himself with uh, Grogu. Um, yeah, Phil Parker making a good comment there. Yoda moved him on to avoid child maintenance. That's a, that's a fair shout, I think. Um, it's it's a galaxy wide problem. Head of the um, Youngling trade, and he only rescued one as well. It's been my other point to make. <laughs> uh, and the the cutback um, in time kind of ended at that point. So it is speculation as to what happened to Grogu next. Yeah. Um, a lot of people celebrating online as kind of like a redemption um, element for Ahmed. Um, I don't know if it is at this point, because how important is Grogu? Obviously he's a central character to the Mandalorian, but what is he in terms of plot for anything? What is he central to? Mm. Um, story-wise, what what you know, what has he achieved as an a character as a character to have changed the galaxy at all? That's a really good point because in the if you take Grogu now as we're seeing him as a Clone Wars era character, he's he's a youngling. He's like Ross Beeman's character, Saws Bandim in Revenge of the Sith. He's there. He's a, he's learning. You know, and yeah. okay, he's from Yoda's species and he's fifty as opposed to six. Um, but clearly they develop slower and yada yada yada. Um, but yeah, you're right. It's you know other than saving a youngling from almost certain death at this point, and 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 in relation to it being a redemption for Ahmed, Ahmed's got nothing to redeem. He's done nothing wrong. So I don't think redemption's the right phrase anyway. So um, for him or for the, any of the characters that he so. played, I don't think anyone particularly criticised Ahmed for his betrayal. Of- Jar Jar, I think. No. no, I think in terms of what he was asked to do, he delivered what he was asked to do. I think there were a lot of people didn't like the character, but there's a, no, there's a big difference you know, between like not liking a character and not liking the act. I don't think anyone can fault his performance. I think if you watch anything um, documentary-wise behind the scenes of the Phantom Menace, he delivered exactly yeah. what he was asked to deliver on screen. Yeah, I'll, I'll I'll do a big name drop now. I interviewed Anthony Daniels years ago, and he said. Uh, that he always had great uh, admiration for Ahmed because he did everything he was asked to by the production and by George and was, was in that regard faultless. In in the same way Hayden was, he played the stroppy teenage kid, just how George wanted it. So, you know, the fault should never be laid at the floor or, or at the door, rather, of the, the actors. They're doing their job. They're doing what yeah. they're asked. You know, they follow direction. And you're not going to say no to George Lucas. So, you know, it's, uh, it's certainly not their fault. Yeah. And uh, we cut back to current time, and uh, Grogu there with the armorer. The armorers made him as um, what you call it? I can't even remember what you call it, but it's, it's, yeah, there was a specific name, was his little chest plate thing, yeah. yeah. Um, and also makes a comment that he'll grow into it, which is um, <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe maybe he won't grow into it. I don't think. Mm. <laughs> but yeah, it's cute um, though being attached onto the sort of the metal shirt that, that Mando gave him uh, not that long ago. Someone's going to shoot him right in the chest, aren't they? It's going to happen. Yep. Hope it's this person. Uh, <laughs> Bo-Katan. <laughs> um, <laughs> she learned how the um, people who follow the way eat. And uh, they'll go and sit on the road and then take off their helmets and eat, which just defeats the whole purpose of the way, I think. We learn like like how often pretty much we've been told now that as long as no one sees one they can take off their helmet in private. Mm. Don't know. I, I I much prefer the idea of them just sort of mushing it all up and drinking it through a straw. Yeah. Uh, quite a sad way to live though. So she sat there by the fire because she was the 
considered to be the the most important one at that point. She got the the prime seat by the fire and she ate her meal in silence while everybody else went and did their own thing. And uh, in the morning, they all started climbing um, the wall to where the raptor was. Um, I kind of liked um, the visuals in this. I thought it was going um, kind of nice. Um, I'd say the visuals this season have really... I mean, not that they've ever really slacked at all, but they really were a bit special this season so far. Um, and it, it was revealed that uh, it was uh, Paz Vizsla's son that they were trying to save. Um, and uh, he sort of entered the nest. And it, my highlight of the episode <laughs> is when the, <laughs> the mother raptor regurgitated his son into the nest to be fed by the kids. Um, but as soon as she realised that there was um, people attacking, um, she grabbed the son again and unpaz Vizsla and she kind of took off with them. Um, Bo-Katan kind of played the hero role again and um, didn't save the kid when the yeah. kid was dropped. And uh, the raptor found out that there's always a bigger fish <laughs> very Jurassic World. I mean, beautifully done. Got to say, it's yeah. beautifully done, uh, and and not unexpected, as I yeah. say. Um, but uh, yeah, it's uh, it served it served its purpose, and and certainly for Bo being sort of the hero of the action scene, uh, as as not only endeared her to Paz, as we like you say, as we find out that's his kid, uh, but also I think to the to the wider group. You know, yeah. she's she's more than earning her place. I'm interested in what the dynamic's going to be between them because obviously Paz has kind of suggested that he would like the Darksaber prior. Um, yeah. And I'd actually, um, I'm just jumping back in the comments there because um, uh, Anakin Cresson made a comment that uh, it was nice getting into Paz Vizsla's history a little bit. And uh, um, I want to know more about the character. He's kind of feeling like he's becoming a major character at um, this point. I think there's more story. Um behind that um, Jack also asking what I thought about the babies they looked horrendous <laughs> I didn't like them <laughs> at all um, Phil bet you heard Qui-Gon's voice saying at that point I did it was very much a prequel moment um, our heroes all arrived back I kind of was interested where Grogu was at this point because he feels very integrated into the group and quite a comfortable part mm. of this um, group as well um, without Din Djarin around it was interesting kind of just seeing where they placed him. Um, yeah. Uh, Bo-Katan was kind of, as you mentioned, made out to be the, the hero of the day. And then they mentioned that these three ugly babies and the most ridiculous thing suggested that they're now going to be part of the group as well. And it's just like, cook them for food. I don't know how they're going to use them that going would be forward. a massive food pan. Yeah. Um... Yeah, I don't know. I, do, I just don't like where this is going with them. I just oh, I don't know what to make of it. I think I think because I think they're just it's another nod back to the holiday special for me. I think the first time we saw Fett, the first time we saw any Mandalorian who was riding that great big uh, Panna Panna Dragon, was it if I remember? Yeah. Uh, and you know, and you've got the Amban rifle that he uses. That's been uh, part of Mando's armory for a while. I guess or, if you make them grow up to be like the mother, yeah, very quick. Well, you saw Boba Fett trying, trying to and, ride the rifle. Yeah, these guys are going to be ra raising them and us flying them. Then it yeah. going to work out okay, but yeah, okay. Yeah. Weird. Don't know what to do. Just depends on how quickly they grow. Yeah. Um, time jump feels like is needed in the series to move things forward a little bit. Yeah, um, yeah. that's the point, yeah. Um, Bo-Katan then had a very interesting scene with the armorer, which I was kind of looking forward to them spending some more time together. And uh, she got a new plate for her arm made um, mm. with, the, with the mythosaur on it. They kind of had a little weird conversation about, oh, you saw a mythosaur? Yeah, yeah, did you, you drunk? <laughs> 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 it was how it came across. <laughs> yeah. Um, not really sure if the armor was really understanding her when she said, yeah, I saw a mythosaur. Oh, did you? And a vision yeah. kind of idea. It was kind of the way it was kind of. Yeah. be um, interpreted but quote Bo-Katan is thinking things because this is how the episode ended with her staring right at the 
with the sore skull and it, <clears throat> she's obviously still got the ambition of leading the Mandalorian back in Mandalore. The Mythosaur is her route to it. With that and the Dark Saber, it kind of has a way to possibly unite all the different um, Mandalorians. And there's, as we now know, they're scattered in various clans all across the galaxy. It's, yeah, it's an interesting one because the way it's being played, it's a bit like last week with uh, Elia Kane when he couldn't, you weren't 100% sure she was a baddie until she just totally gave it away at the end, you know. And I think with this one, it's you know, who is who's playing who at this point. It feels like Din's the reluctant leader who doesn't really want it, uh, but understands the creed and that he can't just give the dark side. Because he basically said to, to Bo last season, well, just have it. I can't take it. I'm going to take it in combat. I'm not going to let you kill me. So, you know, so there's there's lots of subtleties in that sense. But, you know, is the armourer playing Bo? Is Bo playing everyone? Where does, like you said, Paz fit into this? And Mando's not just going to be a passive observer. So it's going to be interesting to see how the, the balance of power shifts because at the moment it feels like they're all on the same page. But I think that's just that's the swan rather than the legs kicking furiously sort of thing. So it'll be interesting to see how, how it, it all plays out. Like- Bo's going to try and lead them. How many of them are going to fall in line? Yeah, I think is the way it's going to go. Um, well, she's feeling sore. She's just lost a castle, so she's you know she's she's got a lot going on at the moment. Yeah, that's very true. Um, one thing that I picked up on, and I haven't seen much chat about it online, but um, Tamura Morrison credited as playing the clone troopers in the episode, yeah. and um, I wonder if that was just a nice production little note because he played clone troopers and maybe they used some footage and that he'd been involved in previously or what was going on with that kind of credit there it kind of seemed like a strange one because for what we saw the clone troopers you certainly wouldn't bring Tamura Morrison in from across the other side of the world just to do that I don't think no, I think I would imagine he was the voice of the clone troopers um, because, I mean, uh, as you know, obviously in the sequel, uh, the prequel trilogy, Clones and Sith, uh, they were all CG, so it was just his head. But yeah. uh, whether they they got, I think more than likely they would have now got actors in armor just to just to do it, you know. Yeah. Um, even though twenty years ago they were doing them as CG characters, but I think I would say that that's how they got Tem involved uh, to do the voice, but. Uh, yeah, like you said, good spot. It was nice to give, uh, nice to see that nod. Um, and even nicer to see him back as Fett at some point this season. Yeah. Um, do you think that's going to happen? I hope so. Uh, they kind of hinted at it. The Empire cover with all the helmets on, it's, uh, a lot of people sort of believe that the bottom left or bottom right one was was, uh, Mando's, uh, was Fett's helmet. So I'd like to think so. I don't quite know how they'd do it without sort of missing too much of a chunk of, well, what did Boba do next after the end of Book of Boba Fett, you know? And they don't want to hop around too much. I mean, fingers crossed there'll be some sort of um, announcement celebration of maybe a Book of Boba season two, or, or maybe even yeah. just a two or three. There's certainly mini- rumours that they're filming a season two as we speak. Yeah. Um, yeah. I would like to see them meet the Armourer. Um, I'd like to see what that conversation would be like. Would he ask her, can you knock out the ding in my helmet? <laughs> It's been annoying me for the past 20 years. <laughs> yeah, there is that. Yeah, there is that. But like I say, because they're all just different. I mean, you know, Django and Boba as, as Mandalorians were just a different proposition to the Night Owls and the Night Watch and, and then to Mando and, you know, and all these different sort of factions and facets of what it is to be a Mandalorian. If they can all kind of get on the same page, then then great, but I'd, I'd certainly like to see Fett return to, the, yeah. you know, the bounty hunting world that we know because it kind of feels like Mando stepped away from that, so there's now an opportunity for Fett to step in. Matt Booker there in the comments saying, no more Fett. You'll be able to get his reaction live on Saturday at 11 a.m. at Celebration to the news that there's a new series of Boba Fett coming. <laughs> so if you want to Hold see that, that turn up Paul next stage, 11 a.m. <laughs> um, Okay, this is our last show before celebration. So just to wrap up the show very quickly, as we've overrun by miles again. Like we um, promised you wouldn't. Can't do that live in the celebration stage. So two now quick what? questions. Well, two quick <laughs> questions to end it. Where yes, do you want Mandalorian to go next? Uh, in my review of uh, Chapter 20 today, I wrote, well, actually it might have been the Mando Issue 8 uh, review that went up, also went up today. 
Um, but one of the things I like about Mandalorian is you can guess where it's going to go next and quite often it doesn't subvert expectation because that's that's too on the nose, but it just doesn't do what you think it's going to do, which I kind of like. So I, I feel like the Mandalorians are going to go back to Mandalore and try and reclaim it because the whole bunkum about, you know, nobody went there because they were told it was toxic uh, and then they go there and it's not toxic. So, you know, there's obviously been some sort of... Uh, uh, blurring of the of the truth there, so I think they will try and reclaim it. But also, we kicked off with those pirates around Navarro. It wouldn't surprise me one iota if Mando and a crew got together. You know, maybe we'll see um, Mix Mayfeld again. Maybe who knows? We'll see Cara Dune again. I don't know. Probably not with the same actress, but you know, the character maybe. I don't know. Um, so it, um, it, there's got to be a thrust. We thought the thrust was. I'd like to see water. another Imperial focused episode. I'd like to see what's happening with Moff Gideon. I'd like to yeah. see more about the cloning side of things. I'd like Snoke to make an appearance. Um, That'd be interesting. Uh, Andy Serkis would be great. Bring him in. And um, yeah, that's where I would like it to go. Um, because what's Grogu's purpose between that scene at the escape and Mando? Well, his purpose has always been about cloning and. Uh, as far as we know just now, so I'd like to see that um, explored a little bit more. And I kind of got a feeling that Moff Gideon himself might have some kind of Jedi background with mm. his obsession to do with the dark saber. So, yeah, that's a good shout. I, I agree I, with I uh, think... Phil Parker. I think the pirates are going to be the main baddies in uh, Skeleton Crew. I think that's almost a given. Yeah. Um, Matt saying the Fettled was not an Emperor um, as well. And uh, and just to wind me up, he's saying that they should go and visit the Great Heap. Um, <laughs> we'll ignore that. Um, will we see Thrawn this season on Mandalorian? Would be a nice way to segment into Ahsoka. It, I kind of feel mm -hmm. that that might be the bookend, um, the, the way they did um, with uh, the scene with Boba Fett that wasn't necessarily relevant to Mandalorian season two, but they could do something with Thrawn right at the very end. Um, of this season just to um, move us into uh, the Ahsoka um, sort of framework so that'll be yeah. interesting so that's Mandalorian yeah. done, next thing, Celebration what what do you want to get out of Celebration what, if, if something on the creative side of things when Celebration's been and done and uh, what's the priority for the direction of Star Wars for you um the confidence from Lucasfilm to announce a movie and the audience to have the confidence that they'll see it through. Uh, I know that probably sounds a bit snippy, but, but we've had a lot of false starts and I'd love to know that we'll be all going to the cinema together in December of probably 2025 to see something brand new brought together by, you know, a, a confident team of good filmmakers and that we can all start enjoying Star Wars at the cinema again. I, I miss going to premieres. I miss going to the cinema in the middle of the week to see it for the fifth time or whatever it might be. You know, I'm looking forward to that. You know, since Panther has been up and running for over five years, we 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 just had Solo and then Rise of Skywalker. And I thought by this point we'd be three or four movies in, and we're not. So I'd like to come out of it with that. I'm pretty confident we'll come out with a lot more television announcements and probably animation. Uh, so I'm, I'm all in for that. Of course, yeah. it's our bread and butter on the site. Yeah. You know that sort of stuff. I'd, but yeah, yeah. I'd, I'd like to I'd see a be. film announcement with a director, a writer, a synopsis of what it's going to yeah. be, similar to what they yeah. did with the Rogue One. And if they're feeling brave, the lead actor on it as well. What's the focus going to be? Then yeah. I'd like to see because it's the UK and we're big football fans over here. For the crowd to start singing, "You're getting sacked in the morning." <laughs> 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 just for the crack <laughs> oh wow well well, well uh, if that happens on day one I hope you enjoy the rest of the convention from your hotel room <laughs> <laughs> oh dear on that note I think we should end it before we dig ourselves a bigger hole Mark bigger, bigger. look forward to seeing you at Celebration and uh, everyone in the comments I hope you can join us at Celebration make it to one of our panels if not, head to the Cosmonera. We'll have a booth over there. You'll maybe grab us there. If you see anybody in a Fanta shirt, say hello. We might have some swag on us we can give you. Um, We've got always some appreciate seeing you. Um, if you're going to Cantina too, Mark's buying the drinks. 
And uh, <laughs> otherwise, we've got the sale barge or Boot Eve as well. Um, so it's going to be jam packed. Uh, no show next week. We're taking a break to get packed and ready to come down to London. And uh, we'll see you there live Saturday morning at 11 a.m. So good night from me. And good night from me. There we go. And uh, we'll, we'll meet again soon. Keep up to date with the latest Star Wars news each and every day on Fanthatracks.com. You can also find us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, Tumblr, and Pinterest at Fanthatracks. And be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and follow Fanthatracks TV to be alerted to new content and to be a part of our live shows.